from the land of sky blue waters, welcome to the Soda Pod. Isha drove me here alongside Seth Topol, and I thank you folks for joining wherever and whenever you are listening. Before we jump into our first segment of the show, I got to give a big shout out to everybody who both showed up again this year as you guys do every year and to everyone who makes the minnesota high school hockey state tourney just the greatest tournament the greatest hockey event the best hockey vibes imaginable had a great great time my second year there i'll talk to seth a little bit about that later in the show but again just had to right off the bat say thank you to everyone who makes that happen every year to the athletes involved they put on a great performance nothing more to say the mem cup the rbc cup hell even the world juniors don't rival that buzz once that that last game of the day starts with the supporter sections, the student sections, 207, absolutely going crazy. Just wanted to give a big shout out to that amazing event. I cannot wait for next year's. It was good to see Mark Parrish there as well doing his thing. Speaking of Mark Parrish, big shout to Northland Vodka. We work with them here on the podcast. Northland Vodka, the best damn vodka in the world, ladies and gentlemen. Lucky us. We have it here in the great state of Minnesota. Small percentage of every purchase goes back into the community, goes back back into local hockey so if you're a vodka drinker it truly is the best we love working with our friends at northland vodka so if they don't have it on the shelves at your local liquor store just ask them why don't you have northland and when are you going to get it on the shelves and i'm sure they'll be able to make it happen go get you some northland vodka today a proud partner of the soda pod. So like you said, at the top of the show, Seth will be joining us in just a moment here. You know what? Before we bring on Seth and talk about some hockey, the Minnesota High School Hockey State Tournament wasn't the only event that I went to this last week. Shout out to our loyal listener and friend, Mateo, who joined me as we went to Lupulin Brewing last week for Big Beer Week. That's right. Between the 4th and the 10th of March, Lupulin put on their annual big beer week. It was unbelievable. Nothing but big beers. New drops every single week within that time. For those of you who've been listening to us for a while, you know that we did a collaboration for the state tournament with Lupulin last year. Shout out the Tourney Flow. We weren't able to brew anything this year, but I was still able to get myself out to Big Lake to enjoy all the festivities there last Tuesday. And Mateo joined us. And that's going to be the hoppy hour today. I put together a whole segment talking about that event. And if you want the full experience, like I say now, every single week, if you're listening on the podcast, if you're listening on the audio side of things, and you want the full experience of this segment, this modified segment, the evolution of the Hoppy Hour, go to our YouTube channel, The Soda Pod, and go watch the full segment there. You'll get the gist of it via audio, but like I said, you'll get the full experience via video. So let's throw it to the Hoppy Hour, and then we'll dive into all things Minnesota Wild and some NHL news as well here on the other side. First, I'd like to propose a toast to UMD goaltender Alex Stalock. To Stalock! To Stalock! I love that stuff. Been drinking it for years. You know, I, I heard they recently decided to add more hops to it. You're all hopped out? I'm some barrel ages. We're here to try these first two. This is the Barrel God 2019 old release. 
I'm gonna taste that one, and this one is a 2024 Barrel God Old Forester Bourbon. All right, this is the 2019 Barrel God. They brought it back, ladies and gentlemen. They brought it back. Shoot, this one came out the first day, and it's still on tap. So, look at the consistency of this. 2019. This might be the last time that they have it here, so cheers. God, that's good. I'm, ha I'm handing the glass over to Mateo here. It doesn't taste like there's alcohol in it. <laughs> what does it taste like? It's a lot fuller. Sweeter, by a long shot. That's about all I got. It tastes really fucking good though. Despite it being aged longer, yeah, the 2019 doesn't have much of a burn on the way down either. Super rich, not super sweet, but you get a few nodes of that as well. But rich and, oh man, super dark. Like, I want to say a, a little creamy, but... <laughs> Mateo's pointing at me, he's like, yup, yup. <laughs> so anyways, 2019 Barrel God. I've actually had this one last year, I believe, when they brought us, well, when we did our beer tour here at Lupulin, and link for the video right there, so go check it out. But yeah, we're gonna keep sipping on this, but we have another one here to try as well. Number two, we have here, Today's drop is the Barrel God 2024 Old Forester Bourbon. It's coming in at 13.6%, just as the title suggests. An Imperial Stout aged in Old Forester Bourbon barrels. Cheers. Ooh. A lot more bright, a little bit more sweet, and you can definitely taste it, it's a lot more bourbon for now I don't think I've ever even had old Forester bourbon before I am I imagine oh Mateo said not bad I imagine that's where the notes are I'm gonna hand over the glass to him definitely well I guess I can tell the 13% must be starting to hit because this one's going down slightly smoother than before but you notice it more on the way down a little bit, you get more of that flavor. I guess is the best way I can describe it. Which one do you like better and why? 2019, because you don't notice it as much. I don't know. I'm more into drinking for like, I want things that taste good, and that one just tastes better, I guess. So Barrel God 19, just a barrel aged Imperial Stout, but it's coming in at 14.6%. Richer, smoother, Man, like a more simple imperial stout than, than that of like. Yeah, barrel aged mellow in taste as they sit longer or yep. as if they get stronger. I can't remember. Somebody explained Both. to me once. Both. But they get smoother. <laughs> yes. So yeah, this one's definitely smooth. That one's very much like. It's young. That bourbon forward, but uh, it's young. I like that. It's young. All right, well, we're going to continue to drink these heavier ones. We'll probably switch to something lighter. And then back to some uh, barrel age to cap off the night, but we'll take you on a little tour of the brewery as well once we go for our next uh, round. But until then, enjoy. start here. This one is the Sexy Hops. The Sexy Hop is a 7.6% IPA. It's not super hazy. Cheers. Oh. F wow. Not hops forward. You can definitely get a little hint of that bitterness, but the aftertaste is so fruity. It's a little sweet upon your first sip. It hits you with a little bit of bitter, then the aftertaste like lingers. Kind of like 
apricot? Let's see what Mateo thinks. Let it linger. That aftertaste is, yep. is yep. it's a little different. It's an IPA I'll drink again, so <laughs> you're not kidding about the bitter is immediate and then almost instantly through. Diving back into the dark stuff. How cool is their logo, by the way? Mateo is just commenting on it as well. Had to get the Lucullin swag for this one. Okay, so we got another barrel age here. This one was another release today, Tuesday, March 5th, 2024. This one is the Snozberry Letterless. Uh, the Snozberries taste like Snozberries. The Snozberries taste like Snozberries. <laughs> Shout out to uh, <laughs> Super Troopers. This one's coming in at 14%. It's a barrel-aged imperial stout with blueberry, blackberry, graham cracker, honey, cinnamon, and vanilla. I'm gonna tell you right now that probably the, the one that I'm gonna walk out of here saying is my favorite is gonna be the 19, the 2019 Barrel God. It's just simple barrel-aged imperial stout that is just, oh, it's, it's just so good. It's not too complex. It's exactly what I want in a barrel age. But it's big beer week. We gotta try the funkier stuff. I imagine this is gonna be sweet as f Oh my god, it smells that way. 2024 Snozberry Lateralis. Cheers. Bro, there's a lot going on there. Okay, one sec. I gotta, I gotta have another. <laughs> Mateo's sitting here watching me laugh and look at this sh <laughs> so, I'm gonna say this. It's good. I'm never gonna go buy a bottle of it. I'm glad I tried it. And honestly, it's a little tart. That's where you get kind of the berries. You taste more blackberry and graham cracker than anything. Even more than cinnamon. I was worried it was gonna be like almost spicy with the cinnamon. It's definitely there, but it's very much, it's very much graham cracker heavy. Yeah, I, I've noticed with some things like IPAs, I like them more when they're colder. Exactly. Which, IPAs for sure you drink cold, the, but like yeah, dark, big barrel I've so never tried one that's actually warmed up. I actually get the logo in the shop this time. <laughs> I like it as almost much as the raspberry one last year. I think I'm a sucker. Do you taste a lot of the cinnamon though, or do you taste more of the blueberry? Okay, yeah. So I tasted more of the berry and graham cracker. It's the I can taste the berry. Okay. Uh, I don't know which one, but one of them is very strong, and I don't mind that because I have a, I have a minor sweet tooth. So there you go. Man, I can't believe how fruity that one is. <laughs> Tracy, well, we'll get her to say something on camera here before we leave, but ran into her, one of our friends here at Loopy Lynn. By the way, Soda Pod, we're super tight with our friends here at Loopy Lynn, and we weren't able to do a podcast before Big Beer Week, but we are gonna do a follow-up one very, very soon. I've already talked to Aaron, I've already talked to Tracy, I've already talked to Marcus, the whole crew here. We miss you, Justin. Big shout out to Tracy. She came up and asked, hey, you guys are here filming, you guys are doing some tastings. Have you tried these two yet? I said not yet, we're getting to them and the beauty that she is brings them to us. So uh, we're gonna dive into, you know, we just had a sweet one, so we're gonna go some a little different. Yep, I, yep, I, I know yep, you, yep. after these two, we will have tried everything that was released today. Take a look at what was released today. And we'll go over everything after and give our final thoughts, but this one is the Seeds of Chains, okay? Seeds of change. You don't really get much of an aroma. Just kind of smells like your 
run-of-the-mill barrel age, coming in at 12%. It is the barrel age imperial stout, much like the 2019, but with chili peppers. Cheers. Yup, I like this one. Whoa. So, you don't get any aroma of spice until it almost hits your lips. And then it's like, oh god, here it comes. Dude, this is like drinking straight up an Imperial Stout and taking a bite of a jalapeno. That's like, wow. This is one of those like, you ain't drinking more than this and I'm lucky that I get a sip on it with Mateo over here because I don't know if I could drink a whole one myself because it's actually fucking spicy. <laughs> Let, let's see Mateo drink this one. Before you take a sip of this one, just tell tell the audience, like, you're pretty new to craft beer, right? Yep. Uh, 20, 22 going on 23. I've never had a spicy beer. Be honest, because of Hoppy and I, you are now a craft beer connoisseur. <laughs> because of, yeah, yeah, because of you and Hoppy, I now go out to craft breweries and try beers. Seeds of change, 12% barrel aged with see chili peppers. There's spice! I got it! So, I didn't get it until it was down here. I didn't taste the spice. It's straight up an Imperial Stout, yep. then just jalapeno. Yep. I like it. <laughs> I'm not it's kidding. Good. I like it. You'd probably like the uh, the jalapeno cream ales then too, because it tastes like a jalapeno popper. I'm glad you like this one. That's that's cool. That's intriguing. I I thought before, I can now see what you're saying. There's no way I could drink a whole one of these, my throat would be burning. Because it doesn't burn in my mouth, it burns down here. It burns on the way down here. But, very good. Cheers. Yeah. Holy shit. All right, last beer from the Tuesday drop. Did I just say Sunday? Tuesday, you said Tuesday. Okay, I, I got I, it. <laughs> Big Beer Week 2024, Lupulin. This is their best festival in my opinion this is their best event that they put on they put on so many events every single year but this is the best one especially if you're a barrel age fan or just getting into it because Mateo until last year wasn't a barrel age guy either and now like you know he's he's my partner in crime for this uh, <laughs> vlog here so last release that we're trying for the Tuesday we've already tried the barrel god old Forester bourbon we've tried the snozberry the seeds of change the barrel god 19 which chef's kiss this is man no joke dude i literally like i can smell it from here oh. so on the last one seeds of change the spicy one that one you couldn't smell much of it at all this one no joke like from here i can smell so much raspberry tahitian vanilla beans lactose Aged for 15 months in Woodford Reserve Double Oak Bourbon Barrels. I love myself some Woodford Reserve. Oh my <laughs> god. <laughs> He's like, stop talking, just drink it. All right, yeah, I'll drink it. Cheers, guys. Thing. I want to get to it. Wow. It's... It's a sweet stout, so it is naturally the sweetest one that we've had so far. It is so raspberry heavy. Little hint of bourbon at the end. Yeah, there's vanilla, that's what makes it sweet, but like, holy f man, this is just, this is just raspberry. And uh, Mateo's been wanting it here, so let's hand it over to him. Bring it close and tell me when you can smell it. There. <laughs> <laughs> I've been, I've, what you don't see off camera is I've been opining about a raspberry barrel aged from last year that somebody handed to me. I was like, yep, I like that. That was the beer. I went down and got even more of it afterwards. So I've been very excited for this one since it got set on the table. Look at that face. Num number one. Number one. It's I remember exactly why last year I was like, yeah, I'll get a I'll get a full glass of that. It's so good. Aged for 15 months. In what oh, you know what's crazy? Guys, I'm feeling it now burn. Like the burn down my chest now. And it's been, what, like three three minutes? I can feel it warming up slowly from here on up. Wow. <laughs> that's crazy. This is, this is the brandy of barrel age. <laughs> Dude, that's a good way to describe it, to be honest. Yep. That one's so good. Uh, 
of all of them. Like, I'm very specific. I have the, like I said, I have the sweet tooth, so this one hits the exact right spot for me. So. Nice hat, by the way. Donka. Thanks to the amazing people at Waggle, I got it last summer, and it's now my favorite hat. And you're sporting the parrot one on your head, so. I was just going to say, got a, got a SP10 for 10% off. Got, Promo code. Got that bird theme going. Got the loon. Oh, yeah. You got the parrot. Should we try it first? This is the wine, right? Yeah, so we got something a little bit different here. We have the adult sophistication barley wine. That's this one. And then this is the triple IPA. Yeah, that's the this triple is, IPA. That's the strictly psychedelic. This is okay. the Z special, the triple Miller IPA. <laughs> So our friend Aaron really likes that one. He brewed that one. We've heard good reviews. 10%. I'll let you try it first. This this could be intriguing. I'm not, like I said before, not the biggest IPA fan, but I'll try it. Maybe not. It's I, a triple, so yep. it's going to be like It's bitter. Hardcore. It's not near, okay, it's still good, but like for me personally, it's probably not my speed. It's not your go-to. No, but I, if somebody handed it to me, I certainly would drink it. It's good if you if this is your flavor. I think you'd like it. All right, strictly psychedelic triple IPA. This is for you, Hoppy. Oh yeah, that's hops forward. Good fruity aftertaste. I like it. I like it. it, it it's a Lupulin IPA. The fact that it's triple though, that's where you know that it's got a lot more kick to it than like the last IPA that we had yeah, earlier yeah. today, which is a lot more flavorful. It had that fruity aftertaste after that quick little hops, you know, kick. Whereas this one, it's it definitely lingers. But again, this is why I love Lupulin. Even though it's a triple IPA, even though it's it's hoppy as. I still have that like lingering flavorful aftertaste of just everything that they put into their beers that's different than your run-of-the-mill craft brewery that has a double, a triple IPA on tap. If you get one from Lupulin, there's gonna be there's gonna be something extra to it. And this one it's it's very complex in the best ways. There's so much flavor to this right after you get that like initial kick of a triple IPA. Oh my god, I love this shit. So, the first taste, a lot more hardcore. The second, the second sip, way, way more chill. Oh! Yeah, see what you mean. You know, I think it's because we haven't really had many palate cleanses. We've yeah. just been going straight with the hard beers, so... We've been drilling barrel, barrel aged all night. That was probably a bit of a shock to the system. Second drink, I, I like it a lot more. Sweet. Actually, it's kind of sweet, eh? Yeah, it's not nearly as bitter as the first go around. I like it a lot more the second time. All right, so the only well, we got a barley wine here, something a little different. Barley wine here coming in at twelve point five percent. This one's called Adult Sophistication, and this is going to be the last beer that we're drinking here tonight because we're cut off after this material because we got to drive home. So uh, cheers, guys. Shout out to another big beer week at Lupulin. We'll do a, a one last little walk through here and say what's up to some of the staff, some of our friends here who grab some, water. grab some more water. Absolutely. For those of you who've been fans of the Soda Pod and you've been following the last two additions of the big beer week collaborations that we've done with everyone, you'll know our friends at Lupulin well, but uh, if we can catch them before we leave, then we'll feature them in this video too but anyways back to the barley one last one that we're gonna review taste here cheers guys big beer week 2024 let's go mm. I really like this I like barley wines I like rice wines I really enjoy this tangy not too not sweet at all packs a good pop punch 
Yeah, tangy aftertaste, but it doesn't linger too much. I could honestly drink a few of these. I know this is probably not Hoppy's cup of tea, and I'm interested to see how our boy over here, Mateo, likes it. It's definitely something different. Barley wines aren't everyone's cup of tea. It's not like people go to breweries to seek out barley wines, but a brewery that can do a barley wine well, I respect, and I'm and I'm going to have a few, and I, I really enjoy this one. The fact that it's 12.5%, though, is crazy. I'll kick you in the teeth. I barely had red wine, so this should be it. <laughs> well, the most I've had is church wine. So well, I mean, that's that's made from grapes. We'll this is see. a little different. This is yeah, obviously. Cheers to the last beer or, or wine, whatever. Something a little different, eh? You're smiling though. I like the change of pace. It's pretty good. Defi definitely good that we had this one in between. Because I don't think this one would taste as good to me if it was straight off the back of the other ones, but off that one, this one tastes great. I really like it. And like you said, I'd have a I'd have a couple in a night and probably get kicked in the teeth by the 12%. <laughs> Does it taste like a 12% compared to some of the, like the IPAs that have been pretty high nope. percentage? No, not a shot. You wouldn't notice it. I think uh, the 12% would sneak up on you. Based on what you've had, there's some IPAs that are like lower percent that are more of like a kick than this one? Yes. Especially the, the one we had earlier, not in a bad way, but you notice it more. Yeah, yeah. Whereas this one, like I said, it would sneak up on you. I don't want to waste no time So part of this lack of composure Exactly what my life ordered A lover and a friend So we're here with one of my favorite people at Lupulin We're here with Tracy Hey So happy that I was able to see you I here I think I'm glad I found you <laughs> um, But I wanted to ask uh, You've been working here for a while You planned many big beer weeks What is your favorite part of this event And why is it one of your favorite events Out of the many that Lupulin uh, put on? Um, so like I First of all I have to give it to Aaron he just does such a great job on these beers and how he selects these barrels and plans this out. Like, it's just so cool to see what one barrel can do to a beer. So I love that we get to show that off for this week. And then I love just the community that we bring in. It's my favorite thing to just watch people that don't know each other sitting down, sharing beers and just like, oh my God, did you try that? Did you try that? And like, they're friends, you know? I met a couple here years ago it was their first date and we were sitting out Aww. by the fire having beers on day one of big beer week oh my god and it was like me and my boyfriend at the time just sitting there chilling talking to them about why we love big beer week and they are on a first date and they're here on day one they're now society members they come every year they get their eight day shirts like they're hooked on this place too and i was like well this is just so cool and just, it's a family and it's just fun to see everybody having a good time enjoying it Thank you for coming. Oh, I, was so, I, got, I was so happy to see that Trace was going to be here. <laughs> and, and hopefully we'll get Marcus to say a thing or two if he's not he's in the gutter there. already. He's, he's having a really good night. He's having fun down there. So. Love it. Peace out on Big Beer Week. Credits for all the end. My Quick trip time, baby. Shout out to our friends at Lupulin Brewery. That was amazing. And it was awesome to have Mateo there as well. Guys, we got we to gotta talk some hockey now here. And this next segment is brought to you by our friends at 7th Avenue Pizza. The best damn frozen pizza on the planet, ladies and gentlemen. Available Kowalski's, Holiday Stations, Hy-Vee, Lunds and Byerly, you name it. If it's not on the shelf where you shop, ask them why. Find 7th Avenue Pizza on social media. Tag Matt and the crew. Ask them why and where you can get one close to you. They're totally interactive. Great family run and local company. And it's the greatest frozen pizza on the planet that I'm not even going Domino's route anymore. I'm Fuck Delicio. It's 7th Avenue Pizza all day, every day. Get you some today. Proud partner of the soda pod let's throw it over to seth and talk all things minnesota wild back by popular demand seth because when i announce that you're going to be joining the show weekly now to do a hockey hit with me so i have to just freaking go off solo all verbose and shit alone dude all the fans of the soda pod were ecstatic so seth welcome back but welcome to 
the start of you know a new little collaboration between Locked On Wild and the Soda Pod Weekly. Thank you for this, man. Uh, welcome. I mean, it's, it's weird saying welcome because you've been here so many times, but uh, this is awesome, dude. Thank you for doing this. And uh, yeah, how are you this weekend? Team Mike Arms Unite. Um, I'm doing great, and you know we're we're coming off of a uh, pretty high vibe win for the Minnesota Wild against the Nashville Predators. Um, and honestly, at this point in the season, if you can get wins and where you see something that has never like hasn't been done in years, that's a that's a good way to uh, to finish your uh, your weekend out. Oh yeah, and and we'll get into John Hines being probably the most based character in sports right now. And it wasn't even because of anything he said. It was just because of his actions. He spoke through his actions there. Uh, but you mentioned it vibes all around in this game, not to mention it being a matinee too, which usually the vibes aren't this high for matinee games, unless it's like the St. Patty's game against Boston that like happened last year. Right. Then the vibes, the vibes are immaculate because everyone is quite frankly, just still drunk or getting started at that point. Not to mention like the sports buzz that you get from being in a live arena, but 14 fights. Let's start there in the last seven games between the Minnesota Wild and the Nashville Predators, too. So when you say vibes, I mean, like, is there a rivalry forming between these two teams or is it just a is it just a divisional case of both of these guys are fighting to get into the playoffs or finish to the end of the season with more points? And so they just have to play hard against each other, especially this season. I think I think it speaks to how tense things are at right now and the fact that these two teams are central division opponents. Um, honestly, as far as the rivalry scale goes, it's probably a little lower on the list than, say, the Blues or the Stars or the Jets. Um, but I'm I'm all for I'm all for there being bad blood between the Wild and every central division team that there is. Like, let's just. Let's just not have anybody in the central division like each other. And it, it leads to just these tense games. And number one and two in the entire NHL in fights this season uh, are the Wild and the Predators. So how crazy that, is that? If you'd have told me that at the beginning of the season, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't believe you. Now I don't know who I would have put above them, but I just like right off the top of my head, but it's just like wild and preds wouldn't have been in wouldn't have been there. Like <laughs> I would have honestly I would have honestly figured like Philly. It just seems like kind of a vibe that they exude or and Delorier being there too. Right. Yeah. Like, <laughs> I don't know, but yeah, I guess, I guess if you're going to be first in something, you might as well be first. Oh, shoot, that, that kid in New York, he's going to start racking up. Uh, he, the, he's going to yeah. start racking up the numbers too. So I'm, I'm interested to see where New York ends by the end of the season, but uh, the yeah. Rangers are catching up. <laughs> God, he's, I mean, we don't, we don't have time on this show. This particular episode coming off of a trade deadline, but you better believe that next next week I'm coming locked and loaded with some conversation pieces around that because I feel like the whole hockey community is split and I'm excited to have that conversation uh, with you. But back to that game, unbelievable uh, first strike by Mason, Mason Shaw in that fight, by the way, like a couple of words were said, drops the mitts and immediately step in right hand. And I was like, damn, like, what is this? <laughs> I was watching MMA all weekend. Like, where, where did you learn that Mason Shaw? So, Hey, Brandon Duhame is gone, right? Dewar's gone. Felino's still there, but Mason, Mason Shaw, I mean, picking up where they left off, right, with the physicality. Coming off, uh, you know, coming off injuries the last couple of years as well, and he's still not afraid to muck it up. He's still not afraid to play that physical role. So I have nothing but respect for that kid. Oh, 100%. And I think, honestly, that mentality perfectly epitomizes Mason Shaw yep. as a player. He's been through four ACL surgeries in his in his life already. And so he goes on the ice every night with nothing to lose because he's already been through as much as he has. And so, yep. yeah, he, that's a great he was point. Chucking fists. It was great. It was awesome. Um, I think Nashville in that you know, four three OT win for the while. Their defense was incredible. And the fact that the wild were able, though frustrated at times, were able to get past that, to win those battles in the neutral zone when needed, because look, a lot of the time in that game, Nashville just plugged up that neutral zone. It was so hard for the wild to get into, to get any momentum into the offensive zone. They didn't have many opportunities to just glide through that glide through center. They had to work for it every time. And I feel like when they did Seth, they were, they were rewarded and it kind of, I don't want to say caught Nashville off guard, 
I don't, I don't think Nashville really thought they were going to piece or pierce through that defense as much as they did later in the game. Early, it seemed like it was a it was a lot tougher for the Minnesota Wild from what I saw, but they were able to weather that storm that Nashville put in front of them. And though it wasn't the most clean game, though it was kind of sloppy at times, though the goals weren't necessarily the flashiest goals, Boldy stepped up when needed to, Kaprizov there to put the puck away when needed. And I thought it, it was a gritty win, but a win that they needed. Well, and it's it seems like it has always come down to the the effort for this team, the battle level for this team. If the battle level is good uh, from the get-go, they're able to stick in these games against these tough teams. And there just have been so many times this season in which it's taken a while for that to kind of meet the level of your opponent. Think of those games against Dallas this season, yep. against Winnipeg this season. Like there, there have been low starts. Uh, so many slow starts. And in the instances in which they've been able to just come out of the gate swinging uh, these last two games, especially against the wild or against the Avs and the predators two playoff teams, uh, the wild have been, they have been able to show that consistent effort that, uh, that gritty work ethic. Uh, and when they do that, they have been tough against teams this year, but there just have been so many instances in which they've dug themselves into big holes early. And it's just too much to, uh, too much to overcome. And y- you talk about those goals, Isha. The top guys again, Kirill Kaprizov, Matt Boldy, and they get in a they get a supporting goal from Ryan Hartman in this one. Um, first goal for Hartman in 20 games. So wow. they they just if they can just get that secondary scoring to match, the top level guys have been on a nice roll here. Kaprizov's been on a nice roll. Jewel Erickson X been on a nice roll. Yeah, no, Matt Boldy's been on a nice roll. It's like you just have to get somebody else to be able to help them out. And when they do that, they've been able to win games. Well, Seth, to uh, what a perfect segue. Is, is that person Adam Beckman? Because I thought he looked damn good today. Now, only one shot on goal. Um, but Nashville, I believe one of their players blocked a shot from him as well. And there was a few very good saves by Saros in plays that he was involved with as well. Not to mention his only shot on net was a beautiful save by Saros, which I even was like stood up and I was like, no, I wanted Beckman to score. Getting getting some, uh, getting, getting, and I could be wrong here, but this is just the eye test. I don't have the, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Seth and, and those listening, but this was the most minutes I believe he's ever had in an appearance playing for the Minnesota Wild. And that's again, from the eye test, I, I think he played the most tonight that I've ever seen him play in an NHL call-up game. And he, and for me anyways, from what I saw, he made the most of every shift. Well, and the thing, the thing that I like with Beckman too, there was a, there was an example that I saw um, during this game in which he got the puck on the wall in the defensive zone and split second, he is looking up the ice to push it. Like without even having to think, without even having to react, his, just his natural instinct is to just push the puck up the ice to uh, to try to make something happen. And you think about it too, like I know we dog uh, Marcus Johansson and Freddie Goudreau all the time, but it just seems like with those guys that the first instinct is to just kind of try to figure out what to do. You know, you you gotta you gotta have a plan and at, go into it right away i feel like you if you try to take time to make a decision in sports you lose and so yeah. the fact that his default setting is just let's push this puck up the ice and try to uh, to turn it into offense is the reason that i think he has staying power and he was mucking it up along the boards he had uh, i think he had was credited with one hit but i think he had a couple of other instances too where he was throwing his weight around like he seems comfortable he seems totally it, comfortable that's a hundred percent it is he just he just looks like somebody that belongs out there yeah and the benchmark for the players that he's replacing in the lineup is not super high so it doesn't feel like he has to do a ton to be able to exceed it and so far he has been yeah as far as the talent level and like you know perceived uh s- scoring ability it's an upgrade, right? And mm-hmm. then look, uh, you and I, we love Duham, we love Dewar, but like, let's call it for what it is. He's more of a talented player. And I was, I was close, Seth. I just brought up the minutes now. In the last three games since being called up with the Wild, 
12 minutes and 58 seconds, nine minutes, and today, 12 minutes and 15 seconds. So a little bit less than his first appearance, but in my defense, he he did more. He was more noticeable. I feel like he was more valuable to the team in, in today's game. Yeah, absolutely. And he's doing it against, it's not like he's doing this against the Anaheim Ducks or the San Jose Sharks. Exactly. He did that today in a playoff game against a Nashville Predators team that had won something like nine out of their last 10. And they just are on an insane run here, even past that. And so he's, he's doing this. He's making an impact. He's leaving his mark against a uh, a really good opponent and that is uh, another thing that I think is really encouraging. Absolutely. I have two more quick takeaways and then we'll move on to some more Minnesota Wild talk here. Uh that save by Mark Andre Fleury in the second on Kiefer Sherwood. I mean, my god, Seth, does this guy still have it? Like he I does. I stretched a lot every day. You know, I stretch an hour every day. I imagine Mark Andre Fleury given like everything his body went through. That guy must stretch like 3 hours every day to be able to make saves like that still, man. Like oh my goodness, that was insane. And he just he makes it look so easy too. Like he makes it he makes it look like anybody off the street could go put on goalie pads and uh, and get it done. Like he just makes it look effortless and you alluded to it. He's seven and two in his last nine starts. Goals against average in that span is two point three something. So he very clearly is still capable of uh, of winning big games. And with how Philip Gustafson has played, and I know Gustafson's numbers are starting to trend in a better direction, but. Um, Mark I, I love, by the way, how you call it how it is. And I saw your chat today in your post. Like, Why are you being so hard on Gustin? I, I want to just start being like, shut the fuck up. Like he's he's <laughs> he's speaking the truth, man. He has yeah. he's he's underperforming. There's been he, four games this year, Seth. Four games where I'm like fucking rights. That was the Gust of Gustafson I saw last year. Four. Yeah, that's it. And it's not a coincidence that Michael Russo in his article for the Athletic said that the coaching staff like needs to see more consistency from Gustafson or they're going to start maybe looking to shop him in the offseason because if this is going to be Philip Gustafson going forward like you honestly at this point are probably better off with another year of flurry and Jesper Volstead being your goalie combo next year because he's one or two good starts on then he's really bad then he kind of gets it back. Then he's bad for two starts. Like he just has been all over the map and, and it's and there. It's tough because he's not like 28 either. Like he's still young where it's like, oh, do, do we, yeah. Do we risk him popping and becoming consistent somewhere else? Or do we, uh, do we, do we continue with the growing pains? But it, so it's, it's, it's a tough situation for the wild right now to decide what to do because it's like, you can't go back from this decision and it's either going to burn you or it's going to be the right decision. Right. I what I like to believe what I hope is the case is just that the league as a whole took the film from his first year of mm. starts which was last year that was his that was his first yep. full body of work the league took that and they found some ways to consistently beat him which is up top kind of in this area right between yeah, right he, above your shoulders he does hang low as well that's his style it's my hope is that he just has not yet or maybe is is working on some some adjustments to that during the season and it's just hard for those to take hold while games right. are going on like the hope is that he's going to be able to find something that works concretely in the off season to where he's going to be back maybe not that full level that he was at last year but even a step below that and a step above this still puts him at, as a pretty good goalie in this league no, I'll take it for sure. All right, last thing, and then we'll move on. I mean, who has the bigger balls, Randy Marsh or or, or John Hines? Honestly, that was the that was one of the gutsiest things I've ever seen. Like, talk he, our he, listeners through it for those who don't know about that specific overtime rule. And let's be honest, no one fucking knew about it. <laughs> I didn't know. Nobody knew, dude. No, but John Hines didn't know. The Gold Flurry didn't know unbelievable this is so nhl they got like a hidden rule that the refs probably didn't even know about until like toronto called them was like whip out your pocketbook and look at uh, there that one that one you gotta ding them for that if they don't score Un unbelievable <laughs> yeah it's it was a situation where if the wilds gave up a goal with the empty net in overtime they forfeit that point they forfeit the one point that they got 
by getting the game to overtime. So you are putting everything on the line to try to win a game. And and not only that, but uh, I think it was Brett Marshall that pointed it out on Twitter. The Wild rolled four forwards at that point. They had Kaprizov, they had Boldy, they had Eric Sinek, they had Zuccarello out there. So there's no there's no last line of defense. There's no defenseman out there that if the puck gets poked away, they can make a play to try to prevent a, an empty net goal. You are it's the equivalent of in like the it's the equivalent of scoring the game winning touchdown in overtime in the NFL and going for two. If you get it, you win. If not, you lose. And it was a huge gamble. But honestly, like I know there have been gripes about some of the things that John Hines has done from a handling young players perspective. I know there's been gripes about that, but he has my full, full respect for making that type of a decision and showing this team like these are the things you got to do when you absolutely have to win a game like. Dean would never have done that. Did you listen to him post game yet? And did you hear any of the questions? Like, tell us what were some of the things he said. Cause I know Jesse asked him a question about it. So he, like, he, I just love that he started and he's like, we're here to win, right? Yes. <laughs> like, that, that was what a quote. We're that was here great. to win. I mean, 10K is going to make a shirt about that, right? 10K takes shot. Know. They're gonna have they're gonna have a shirt about that like Monday when this is dropping. Um, I thought that was awesome. You you know the last time it's been eight years since this was brought up. And again, I, I'm not I'm not um, I'm not saying that I knew I remembered this. I knew about this. It's just funny now that like I'm looking this up and every every new like sports outlet who covers hockey and who you know blogs about hockey or like I said writes about hockey or whatever. There's articles right now in the last I, I just looked it up right now like four minutes ago one came out. An hour ago, 44 minutes ago of the time of this recording on Sunday evening. And then there's a Reddit thread from eight years ago that when the three on three um, overtime was implemented, that was one of the rules in there that like everyone saw like like the terms and service. Right. When you when you click in the terms of service, from, it was there in plain sight, plain sight, I say, as one of them. But it's just something, you know, everybody didn't even think of we all bat an eye because it's like no one's pulling their goalie in overtime right so it's one thing that we all i swear anyone who read that all probably re- like saw that and then just completely like put it out of our minds because we're like that's never gonna happen but it's just funny now that like this this reddit thread from eight years ago is bumping right now with getting more traction because everyone's talking about this um I'll, I'll hit you with a couple of things here russo tweeting out uh there are two instances where a team lost its overtime point for pulling the goalie in OT and being scored upon. Um, can't find is it's basically impossible to find how many times it's been tried. The last time it was done successfully was when the Los Angeles Kings, um, I, I think they were playing Pittsburgh. There were like three seconds left in overtime and they had the puck in the offensive zone. So they did it because they were trying to win that offensive draw and they ended up actually scoring a goal. So this even goes beyond that because the wild just did this. Like, let's go win this. Let's go win this game. (laughs) And so it's just, it was it it, honestly, I still this month, this long after the game, I still cannot believe that Heinz did that but as he like as he said he's like one point does us no good zero points does us no good we had to have two points yep. so full credit for going and getting two points in a game against Nashville and Nashville very clearly was not in expecting that to happen no like, that, that threw them off guard just like it threw all of us off guard they I, honestly it just it, it's hands down one of the it, it's one of the highlights of the season for sure it's got to be I know. And there's some pushback. Like our friend Alex was like, this is NHL, you know, s- stupid rule. And of course, me being me, I was like, this is amazing <laughs> that this played out the way it is. Now, if the Wild would have lost, you know, we, we, we would have a different conversation here, right? Now, the, my mind just goes to imagine if Torts was coach and they lost and he didn't oh. know about that. Oh, my God. We're, we'll get into Torts in the last segment of this uh of the show guys um, when we talk a little NHL. But uh, that was the first thing my mind went to is like, could you imagine if they lost and he didn't know about that? <laughs> He would be irate. Be fine more than five grand for what you'd say to the refs. It's uh, hopefully or, uh, those. Grand. Hopefully that poor. Hopefully those podcast hosts that uh, 
that he just never talks to ask the first question. He's like, I'm not, I'm not answering your question. Oh man. All right. So great win against the Nashville predators um, and a relatively easy week this week should, should get four points against the Arizona coyotes and Anaheim ducks as I'm, we're both knocking on wood here uh, this week. Uh, let's move on to, let's be honest, the, the most important piece of news surrounding the Minnesota wild Marat, who's Nadinov is in the state of Minnesota. He arrived this weekend and actually skated with the team Sunday. Well, skated Sunday morning. I don't know if it was with the full team or just with the trainers or whatever, but he's been off the ice for five days, traveling, getting ready to come to the United States. First time, by the way, in the United States as I guess never played here for junior or any international competition either. Um, And before we get into the quotes on John Hines and I hear just Seth's thoughts on this whole situation, I, I got to just call out not only this account, but whoever was feeding this account on Twitter, this information, following Murat Huznadino's every move as he made his way to the United States. There's a lot of concerning and crazy fans out there, Seth. Like I said, following his every move, the flight number, which gate he was at in real time. I'm not kidding. I saw this on Twitter when I was hitting up the state tournament in the morning, I mean, it's 9 a.m. Central time and we're getting play by play in real time on Twitter. Murat Husandinov's every single move. Like I'm, I'm, I'm surprised those psychos didn't get his credit card information and share that on Twitter while they were at it, you know, by thinking they're doing all of us a favor being like, look, Murat's here. And by accidentally doxing him. I mean, look at this Seth. Then for those who are listening to the podcast, come over to YouTube, the soda pod, the episodes here, as I show Seth, just this thread of literally every move that this guy has made. Okay. There's where he's sitting on the fuck. Is that not concerning? Now I'm showing the whole world here on YouTube, but he's in, he's here. He arrives safe. Isn't, isn't that a little concerning stuff? Denmark, Newfoundland, Quebec, Ontario. Uh, this freaked me out. I'm not going to, I was like, what the fuck? I, Isha, I'm a huge, I'm a huge advocate for (laughs) less time on the internet. Um, in just a lot of general work areas of life. This one especially like I I would have been perfectly fine just knowing when he got here from the team or him because he posted a video. Yeah, like him posting, hey, wild fans excited to be here. Uh, That's enough for me. That is that is all I need. Like I I wouldn't need his I wouldn't need what he for uh what he ordered on the plane like for oh food. that's there too by the way someone someone asked what he was eating i didn't share that in the little thing but no because i because i went through because people were commenting also like oh did you see him he had a layover here what, what did he do like it was nuts dude no i i just i'm just ha- i'm happy he's here but that that's really all i have been looking for and it's not like i was seeking this out to try to like you know dunk on wild fans at all i was like this was the first thing i saw when i opened twitter so i bookmarked it I was like this is going on the show i'm bringing this up with seth because this is completely fucked <laughs> anyways um now that he's here let, let's let's talk about the positives now that he's here he skated john hines had nothing but good things to say about him he said and he was quoted uh saying he's certainly going to get an opportunity here in short term which for me Awesome. That checks a box right there. It just depends on trying to help him get acclimated and give him the best chance to be able to be successful. But he looked good out there. Good skater. Good shot. So we are excited. So I ask you, Seth, do you think he gets into Tuesday's game against Arizona or do you think he makes his debut Thursday with the Ducks? I know you talked about this a little bit on your post game show, guys. If you're listening to this and you want a little bit more on the weekend that was the Minnesota Wild, go to Locked On Wild YouTube or the audio side wherever you get your podcast from and check out the post game show there. For me, Seth, before I get your takes on it, like assuming he doesn't, or assuming he gets another good skate Monday, today, the time uh, that you guys are listening to this and a practice, I think it's possible against Arizona because Arizona, you know, they're they're not really in it anymore. They're they're not the most menacing team. This isn't Nashville. This isn't St. Louis. This is one of those top of Western teams. This isn't you know, the, the Avs, for example. Um, and not to mention like Anaheim's, if, especially if we get a whole week of work in Anaheim's, you know, a, another more friendly team 
to be playing yeah. against to get your NHL debut. But having said all that, given that he's only been here for a couple of days, he's only had we only he will only get two skates. Do you think he gets a Tuesday game against Arizona? And do you think it being Arizona kind of makes gives him a little bit more of a chance for getting out there on the ice? If this is gonna this is probably gonna sound weird, but if let's say let's say the team wants to have him play on Thursday. Let's just say that that's that's what they're hoping because you you get him a Monday practice, you get him a Wednesday practice, you get him to be around the team for the the entirety of the week with these games being at home. I'd like him to dress for Tuesday's game, go through warmups, mm. like go through and just kind of take that whole experience in. And uh, obviously, I would love to see him play, but I, I think the other piece to this too, Isha, is. I want to see him get opportunities at wing and center because oh, yeah, like I, I think he could play. I think he could play in either spot. It gives him an opportunity to kind of feel out how to do both of those roles differently. And I, I would love to, I'd love to say, I think we'll see him debut, but honestly it probably makes more sense. Give him Monday's practice, let him kind of then again, he saw everything that uh, that happened in Sunday's game up close. So maybe it does just make sense to uh, to just throw him in and uh, let him get his feet wet. If it was any other team, like uh, I guess I guess Anaheim. So if, if it was any Asterix Anaheim because they're playing him on Thursday. If it was any other team, I would say, I guess, I guess, sorry, Sharks Anaheim and you know these bottom teams is fine. If it was any team that they had to compete with within the division or any other team in the West, I would say absolutely not. Yeah. Because, like you said, he kind of went through some of the motions here already on Sunday. He skated. I wouldn't be opposed to it. If anything, as a fan and someone who covers the team, I would be okay with it given this situation. Having said that, Thursday is probably the better move. So, like, there's a little, there's obviously a little bias in me. I'm a big fan of this prospect. I've wanted to see him in North America for a while. And that he's got a little bit of, you know, time already with the team and skated. That's like, eh, I, I will use that to my argument that, okay, yeah, he should, he should uh, play on Tuesday. Realistically, though, for all those listening, like, Thursday is the better option. But, Seth, you, you hit the nail on the head and you said it there. If they want to play him Tuesday, if they want to even dress him, even if he gets a, a couple shifts or, or whatnot, yeah. if they're not too concerned with you know taking out a body to have him there, then I'm perfectly fine with that, man. I'm perfectly fine with that. My my big thing, too, is I would hate, even though this seems like this is probably the route they're going to go, I would hate for him to come in and for Adam Beckman to come uh, out. And that was line. my next question was, who goes, Beckman? <laughs> Honestly, like at this point, you're playing... See, you're playing those fourth line guys like seven, seven minutes a night. And I know that's because you are in like we have to win all these games mode. So the top line guys are getting a bunch of minutes. But like I at this point, I, I would rather probably pull Lucini out of the lineup and just give Marat a spot um, somewhere there. I mean, honestly, I want to see him get an opportunity to play with Rossi. So I know that's. I know that's second line at this point, but I want to see because that's been one of our gripes for that second line is that that third guy with Zuccarello and Rossi a lot of times isn't shooting the puck if it's Marcus Johansson. And I think who's Nadinov is enough of a playmaker that he'd be fine in that spot. Mm -hmm. Um, I just I just don't want to do the whole like we're going to throw you on the fourth line and then you got to earn, you got to earn your minutes beyond that. Like put him in a spot to actually succeed. Yeah. I think, and again, as much as I love Mason Shaw, I think Jake Lucini, Mason, Mason Shaw, those are the two guys you rotate in and out to give Marat, you know, some time and, and same with yeah. Beckman. Right. So those four guys will be the musical chairs right now. But I think with Beckman, like he's got three games. He's 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 actually has some momentum. Yeah, he's not lighting up the lamp or anything like that, but he's had chances. We already talked about how we both feel he looks comfortable out there. It would only do him a disservice if you take him out right now and put in the shiny new toy. Let them yeah. both be there, right? Yeah, you've taken some grit out of the lineup already, but Felino's still there. Hartman's still there. It's not like you're shooting yourself in the foot. If anything, it's like it's like replacing. Do him with Beckman. It is an upgrade at the end of the day. If you look at the big picture, it is an upgrade. So if you take Shaw for a game, if you take Lucini out for a game, 
even if he, even if there's some growing pains in the first two games where he makes some mistakes, dude, that's still an upgrade at the end of the day, right? And, and I'm, gl- reps. I'm glad you put it at those four and did not mention Vinny Letary because Letary honestly is like a step above. I think he has played well enough this season to deserve to be in the lineup at this point. And he has similar levels of speed. And I think he plays with enough to where he can basically be that Brandon Duhame that you're looking for. Um, yeah, he's played awesome this year. Yeah. He's played awesome this year. I've been really impressed with him. Yeah. So yeah, I I fully agree. I think, and honestly, you could you could probably for if you were going to get him in for Tuesday's game, just give Mason Shaw a breather. You yeah. know, after yeah. he's he's coming off of major for the fourth time, a major ACL reconstruction, <laughs> reconstruction. He's like fighting. I just what a beauty. I can't believe it. It's, it's amazing. Like it's oh, just, man. it's just such a great story for this team that he just continues to battle back. And um, he's, uh, he's going to, he's given them a huge lift already. And he, he's making an impact too. Absolutely. Uh, for all you wild fans who are excited to see what has Murat, who's Nadina have been doing. You don't want to watch, 30 different channels to watch, you know, one or two highlights here and there. Z just put together, Spoke Z just put together a 14, or it might even be 16 minutes. It's like a 15 minute, we'll say. 15 minute uh, compilation of all his highlights from his time in the KHL on the Soda Pod YouTube channel. We posted it last night, Sunday night. So go check it out. 15 minutes, non stop plays, shifts, highlights. From Murat Khuznadinov, everything you need to know about this guy, all the good, everything that sh- that everything that uh, that you need to know why the Minnesota Wild picked this player, why we who cover the team are so excited for this player to come, all all those questions will be answered. Go check it out. The Soda Pod is the last video we posted, and it's also pinned to the channel there. And uh, if you like that, subscribe as we have a lot more highlight videos as well. Yurov, Riley Height. Uh, Hunter, hey, and more to come. Anyway, Seth, um, we'll have more to talk about Marat in the coming week. So let's move on. I want to point out just one. We could swoon about Brock Faber the whole show, but man, how crazy is it that this kid is seventh among all skaters in ice time right now? All skaters. And at one point, he was second just to Drew Doughty. It's it's unreal, and honestly, I I know this is gonna help segue into to where we're going with this. But like the minutes that Brock Faber has played this season, if you are looking at um, if you're looking at the Calder Trophy race, like the minutes that he's playing this year, I'm sorry, just have been so much more critical to where the Minnesota Wild are at right now. They're they're battling tooth and nail to try to make it into the postseason. Faber has played number one defensive defenseman minutes for large chunks of the season with Jared Spurgeon and Jonas Brodeen both out at points. Yep. Faber's been the number one guy. He's logged 30 minutes of ice time more than I think any other defenseman in the league. And the fact that he is also trending towards being a 40 to 50 point player as a rookie. Come on. Like Bedard is Bedard is great. He's obviously a fantastic talent, but he's not playing on the power play much. He's not playing on the penalty kill. He's not giving you an impact defensively. Let's be honest. He's getting, he's getting easier. Not, not easy. He's getting easier matchups when available. Yeah, this is, this is the classic. Do you value points more than the overall product. Yep. hundred percent, hundred percent. And there's, there's no bias here at all because we didn't expect, we knew he was going to be good. Seth, we knew he was going to be good. I didn't think he was going to be this good so fast, especially with the college schedule. And that's one of my critiques about the college schedule is that, you know, junior hockey in Canada, even at the junior a level, and you're playing mostly like weekends, you're still playing fucking 60 to 70 games a year. So your body's used to that. Dude, you can't tell me that he was used to this schedule coming in here and he's still absolutely dominating. People are saying, oh, is it is he slowing down because of the schedule? No, no, he's slowed down the last couple of weeks because he's been hurt. And Russo yeah. confirmed that last week. Um, I mean, it, it's, it's truly incredible. Now, 
Connor Bedard plays an average as a forward of 20 minutes a night, 46 points, 19 goals, 51 games. Look, he's on the Chicago Blackhawks. I'm going to say a minus 37 doesn't really mean anything, especially because his other fancy stats are, are, are pretty damn good. Look, he's excellent. I'm sorry, man. Brock Faber is a defenseman playing top minutes in the National Hockey League on this Minnesota Wild team. Penalty kill. I mean, like they they, they thrown him to the fire on special teams like in the first two weeks of the season, anyways, and he's thrived. So like, all right, we're just gonna keep you there. He's first in block shots amongst amongst rookies with twenty six on the season. First in assist, second in points only to Bedard, and like I said, first in minutes at twenty five. I mean, there's nothing more this guy can do. Thirty seven points, sixty five games played as a defenseman, as the top defenseman, and he's not a point guy first. He's not an Eric Carlson. He's not a puck moving defender first it's not his job to make that first play to get involved in the rush yet he does that and he back checks and he picks everyone's pocket and he's strong up against the boards like it's incredible that he's this good in his fucking rookie season man yeah and he he had never run a power play with the gophers no uh, that's right before coming here and now we i remember when he first got thrown onto that top power play unit right before Jared Spurgeon uh, came back before he got hurt again. Um, people were clamoring for him to continue to hold that spot. I know I was like, he just looked so natural at it. And that is, I think part of the mystique too for Brock Faber is he just makes everything look so natural and comfortable out there. And let me hit you with this. He is on pace to play a full 82 game season and knock on wood to, to ensure that he stays healthy the rest of the year on pace to play 82 games. He's on pace for 48 points. He's on pace for eight goals, 40 assists as a rookie defenseman and in wins this year, he has 25 points in 30. And this is not updated uh, for today. Uh, or for the the Nashville win, but in thirty in thirty wins going into the Nashville game, he had twenty five points. So he's almost a point per game player as a defenseman, as a rookie, in wins that the Wild have had, which tells you he's having an impact yep. in every single one of those wins too. What does a minus thirty nine tell you, Seth? You ain't got much impact in those wins. Spot uh, spot the lie. Like I I know he's in losses this year, uh, Connor Bedard has 26 points in 37 losses. He's a minus 38 in those games. Um I it's it's a pretty clear choice to me and it's not no, it's it, not it, any it, disrespect on Bedard. It's just no. Faber's play has been Furthermore, high leverage. Everything that he's done this year has been in a high leverage situation. Yeah, and furthermore, the Wild haven't been a good team this year. Right? So if the Wild were top of the division or like, you know, 2-3 only losing regular, regularly to the Avs or, or Dallas or the Avs being the only guy or the only two teams above them. And they're pretty much if they played a season even like last year, then I'd be like, okay, Bedard's on the the bad team. Faber may be getting some of these, you know, second assists because the offense is buzzing. No, that's not, that has not been the case this year. He has been helping to carry this team. And I think that's one of the, I think that is at the end of the day, the overarching and biggest difference is that the team has not been good. And the only reason they're in there is 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 on is because of him. If you take Faber out, if if you take Connor Bedard out of the Blackhawks lineup, they're still bad. Like they're, 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 that's not going to change. If you take Brock Faber out of the Minnesota Wild lineup, they're probably number one pick bad this year. <laughs> and it's not even an exaggeration. No, it, like it's, it's true. It's he he just has had such an impact up and down. Like you take out what he does for this team, and they are. They are head and shoulders above where the San Jose Sharks and Chicago Blackhawks well, it's are. It's a revolving door with injuries on the back end, too. Who has been the staple there all year? Brock Faber, man. It's, it's truly amazing. I, I'll, I'll, I'll swoon over him every podcast. I don't care. <laughs> yeah, I, honestly, if you, want, if you want to bring him up every week, I'm, I will never get tired of talking about him. I love it. I love it. I, I can't wait to talk to him someday. I can't wait to bring him on the show because he, he's just... He seems awesome. I know Hoppy's going to be interviewing interviewing him first because he's got the Joe Smith connection now, but I got the Seth Topol connection. So let's go. fucking go, Seth. Let's go. <laughs> um, all right. Before we talk a little bit about NHL in the, the final part of the show here, 
Um, the Minnesota High School State Attorney last week, Seth. I mean, you're 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 a Minnesota born and bred guy. I'm still new to the state, but I did go last year, and what an incredible experience it was. This year, I mean, just the same, man. I say it all the time. The Memorial Cup, the RBC Cup in Canada, that's the, the CHL Cup and the Junior A Cup. Unbelievable experiences in their own right. World Junior, international play when a Canadian or American uh, city host it or cities host it. It's an immaculate vibe. There's just something more unique about this event that gives it just a different feel than those other tournaments, which are very Canadiana in their own right, where this one is just Minnesota. And I feel that pride. I feel that passion. And it's just one of the best sporting, not even just hockey. It is one of the best sporting experiences I've ever had the pleasure to go to now twice. It was a great day of, of, of hockey. It was a great day of drinking beers and hanging out with the boys before the game at before the games at Tom Reed's and a big shout out to Hoppy and his brother, Joe, who've kind of included me on their tradition of going to the semifinal games on Friday. I will say that the games this year weren't as good, weren't as competitive. Um, there were a lot more blowouts. There were a lot more one-sided than, uh, than 2023, but that didn't, that didn't overshadow or that didn't hamper the experience as a whole. Yeah. Um, I mean, just so, some of your uh, takeaways from this last week's tourney. You know, it was it, people ask from people ask from other places, like how can you call yourself the state of hockey when you have never won a Stanley cup? This is why you get regular. I I'm pretty sure every, Almost every game that was at the XL Energy Center was a sellout for high school games. Friday too, dude. Friday it and Saturday. Was, there was like, I saw, I think it was Hoppy that tweeted it out, that there were like 100,000 people that attended the state hockey tournament this weekend, which is, it's insane. Like, it is such a devoted following. And it, this was one of the, this is one of the rare years where the section tournament was actually like, on a full tilt level compared to the state tournament games, but y you still have people showing up in droves. If you're not online, the moment the tickets are released, you are not getting any tickets. It just, that's it what's is crazy is you can still find, you know, cheap games, cheap tickets to Stanley cup games. And, you know, in the opening rounds too, mm -hmm. you ain't, you, you're not finding Saturday tickets for the tourney. It's not no. happening unless you're paying an arm and a leg. It is the hottest ticket in the state of Minnesota hands down not even close yeah. and that that is why minnesota is the state of hockey because you see all these players that come through playing hockey here in minnesota that go on to other things like it's one of the hottest pipelines of hockey players in the nhl today like we had a good example of uh, we had a good example of it uh, for the Nashville Predators, all the ties to Minnesota that they had um, throughout their team. Like they're, they're just every team, it seems, has somebody that has some relation to Minnesota. And you know, I think the coolest part, too, is you hear the stories about like the players really focusing in on uh, what's going on when we get to tourney time. Like they're still they're still fully invested in it, too. and. It is the pinnacle, like it's the pinnacle celebration of all of the hockey that uh, goes on in this state, and it, it just they they just knock it out of the park every single season. Like you've got exciting games, you have the perfect venue in the XL Energy Center to host. Um, it, it really is just a, as as good as it gets for uh, for the high school hockey fans uh, throughout the state. And uh, when I was there for the evening game, Section 207 got cleared out because the fuck Edina chants were <laughs> buzzing, dude. And I loved every single second of it. Oh, uh, the poor Hornets. Oh, my goodness. Yes, the poor Hornets, set. Those poor Edina folks, man. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Scott says I'm becoming a Minnesotan because I... Uh, well, A, because, you know, him and Joe from, you know, from Mound and... I was cheering against Orno, so they're like, oh, "We love that." And uh, and now that like I, you know, hate Edina almost as much as the Maple Leafs. Now they're like, oh, "One of us, one of us." Big uh, big ups for the Saint Cloud Saint Cloud Cathedral Crusaders. If I could talk, that um, the, in my in my old stomping grounds, my Saint Cloud days, I didn't go to Cathedral. 
I went to uh, St. Cloud Apollo, but um, Crusaders always, uh, always repping it. And it's funny too, their head coach um, of the Crusaders actually played hockey with Cathedral. So able to oh, nice. win them a state title. That's amazing. As a player, that's, that's pretty hard to top. Congratulations to them. Congratulations to everybody who competed on the girls' side the week prior and the boys' side this week. Um, my my roommate, uh, he coaches uh, high school girls hockey, so it, it's it's cool for me anyways because I he's watching those games too, and obviously that that's not as popular as the boys. They're not selling out the the ring, but it's cool that you know Joe always has those games on, so you know I I at least get to show a little support to to them as well. So congratulations to everybody who made it. War Road on the women's side. Um, and, uh, yeah, another great tournament in the books, Seth, one thing we have to give a shout out to one thing we have to celebrate though. It's, it's a little sad, uh, Lou Nanny calling his final Minnesota high school state tournament game last Saturday. Uh, for those on the audio side, you'll hear this for those on YouTube. Check out this, check out this little clip of the arena and everyone just celebrating and saying thank you to Lou Nanny. I love it. You can hear the loo <laughs> in the background. Um, what That's does he part... mean to the? What does he mean to hockey, in Minnesota? Seth? Oh, he's he's synonymous with Minnesota hockey, and I, I think the best part too, the coolest part about this is for those that listened this year, he's still got it. Like he's still as good as he has ever been, and so he gets the opportunity that you know I, as, as somebody who has has seen a lot of great. Um, journalists come through the state of minnesota and broadcasters like you rarely get the opportunity to kind of go out on your own terms like we see this with athletes all the time that you maybe hang on a little too long and then you you have injuries that you're dealing with throughout the rest of your post playing career like he could still do this he's 80 i think what 82 he could still do this for as as many years as he wanted to but he's getting that opportunity to kind of to go out and ride off into the sunset on his own terms, which I think is is a, f a cool part of this. Going to miss him selfishly. Going to miss uh, having him on the on the broadcast, obviously. But um, no, just if you put an, a Mount Rushmore together, what I would do is I would put him and then I would just chisel off the rest of the faces and just have him be the only one. Like, you want to talk about a great opportunity for a statue? outside XL Energy oh. Center. I like that. I like that. 60 years of covering this Unreal. tournament. Unbelievable, Unbelievable. man. Un I had to like, I was like, wait, did I hear that right? 60 years? No, big shout out to Lou, Lou Nanny, an absolute legend, you know, back in the day on the ice, now off the ice in the booth for many, many years. And like Seth said, synonymous with hockey in Minnesota. All right, let's move on and talk a little bit about the NHL here. We're not going to, dissect the entire trade deadline mostly Seth because pretty much every hockey fan who listens to this podcast who listens to your show and who is just you know a crazy hockey fan like us we've already like the, the page has been turned right like the deadline is over over the weekend we we uh, we you consumed it all so we're not going to like go through every single trade we will get to just going over some of the key trades that we liked that stood out for us and just quickly going over some of the Minnesota acquisitions look there's not too much to say on them but we will you know show them some love we will highlight them here but before that john tortorella is in the news so we have to get to <laughs> get to that first step suspended two games uh for i wrote in my notes here for the nhl being soft no no for uh for unprofessional content or uh conduct I'm sure there was some unprofessional content that came out of that unprofessional <laughs> conduct as well <laughs> uh the flyers in their game against the Tampa Bay Lightning, lipping off to the ref in, you know, textbook Tortorella fashion when he is upset, we shall say. He was fined $50,000, dude. 
$50,000 for unprofessional conduct directed at the officials by refusing to leave the bench area after being assessed a game misconduct at 10 or 49 of the first period against the Tampa Bay Lightning this last weekend. Looks that I'm no stranger to Tortorella being suspended. Like as a Canucks fan, he got a hefty suspension for trying to go after Bob Hartley after the first period of that line brawl of a game, which he was famously quoted saying and telling um, oh, Tom Sestito when Tom Sestito asked why he started the fourth line. He's like, well, they're going to start their idiots. We're going to start ours. And Tom goes, Thanks, Torts. But anyways, uh, he got a 15-day suspension, six games without pay, and only $25,000. That was in January 20th of 2014. I know it's less games, but why is it 50 grand? I mean, is inflation that crazy, Seth? What is going on here? I I really don't get this. Like, if you're... (laughs) You don't need to send... You don't need to send a message to NHL head coaches that this kind of thing won't be tolerated. Like, especially to Torch, that's the wrong guy to send the message to because, like, he doesn't give a fuck. And we all know the players are going to help cover this. I like, I think it would have done enough if they would have chosen one or the other. But, like, I, I watched the highlight and, you know, first, I don't know what he did to his wrist, but that just. How badass is that to have? I have the clips. Do you want me to play them and we can talk about them after? Yeah, uh, I got, fire, I got, two, I got two of them here. Motion to Tortorella. Hey, you go. Hey, he's going. No, he's, look, I'm not, not leaving. Going. Well, this, you're not going to win that one. This is unbelievable. I should say they were down four nothing in the in the first period, so he was not happy. With only two shots on net halfway through. Label Macaulay is saying you got to go. I'm not. I'm not leaving. I'm not. This I'm is not unbelievable. <laughs> you play. He's got over 700 wins. In- <laughs> okay, and then so here's when he's walking off. There after all the penalties and flyers are going to be I'm short-handed. I'm standing here right here, motherfucker. That's what he told the ref. You can fuck right off. <laughs> this is full of shit. So Farabee will serve the minor. <laughs> You think he got that caster punching a wall Tartura after this game? His way you, you called it, Scott. It's just... Oh, it's just my amazing, God. I mean... It's an amazing highlight. How can you... A, how can you not love Torts? B, is the NHL not in the wrong for this? Like you said, one or the other, man. One or the yeah. other. And it's, it's funny, too, because it, you can very clearly gather that he wants an explanation for one or for an officiating call. And the fact that they just simply would not like you diffuse this whole thing. If you just like, if you, and yeah, you're going to get your ear chewed off by going over there, but it feels like a situation that the officials let play out that way because of the fact that they just were like, nah, we're not gonna, we're not going to oblige him. Like, just, just go over there and say, yeah, we, here's what we saw. Is it out of the realm of the possibility to assume that the refs, especially those who have to deal with, with torts for now, what are we at? Game 60 ish. Do you think at this point they're just like, whatever we can do, if we have a chance to just get back at this fucking asshole, like we're just not going to, you know, you know what I mean? Because like you said, they, they could have avoided this, but instead they're like, we can wind up torts. Let's 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 do it. Why not? We have, you know, this is just like like superiority complex sort of thing from the zebras. It's like when a dog is barking at you and you go up and you try to pet it and it bites you. You're like, what the, what the hell did you do that for? It's like, really? You didn't? Or, uh... or where I thought you were going to go with that. If, if a dog is barking at you and you go up to it and just fucking yell at it all aggressively and it gets even more angry. <laughs> no, seriously, that's what it looks like. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, you're going to poke the bear there? I don't know, man. It's... It's a choice. It's certainly Look, a choice. Two games suspension, fine. You know, yes. You got to be professional. I'm not saying that Torts gets a pass because he's old school because it's Torts. If you if you if you're gonna present yourself in that conduct, sure, you kicked out of the game, get a two game. Fifty grand is insane, dude. Yeah, it's, it's insane. It's preposterous. Like, because like what, I, I know he's making a penny, here? but like he ain't, he ain't a player, okay? Like that that's that take. He's good. That that's a financial hit for anyone. You think he's gonna? You think he's gonna change? As a result, if anything, he's gonna be more salty. You think about too. You think about too the plays that we see on the ice, heavy hits, hard hits by players that warrant suspensions, or 
those that don't. And what is the like? What's the maximum fine that they're going to get for something that uh, that gets a uh, look at by the league is five grand. Nothing that Torts did here warrants anywhere close to the same level of um, the same level of response as those types of plays. But because it happens, because it happens to the officials who we all need to be, we all need to be nicer to. Like that's that's why this happened. Is it's like there's too much talk about the officiating. We need to we need to give them a break. But in reality and this is something the NHL does regularly is by doing this and by having this be the punishment that generates more conversation about it because it it is so far and above what should be happening. And there's no accountability because there's no, there's no even representative for like um, the, the, the refs union or whatever to come out and speak to media, which there should be. And for me, you know, it, it's, it's just, it's a similar situation in um, mixed martial arts for me, Seth, with the judging, not necessarily the refs, because the refs will make statements. They'll come out and do interviews and they all have Twitter or whatever. The, the judges who like, we will see three completely different scorecards which like for me just blows my mind. Like it, you have to explain yourself because you're dealing yeah. with these people's livelihoods. Because if they win the fight, they get a win. They get their win pay. You know, you, you get your show pay to fight, but you don't get your win pay. You know, so you're especially in close split decisions when you have someone who's seen the fight in such a different way. Like what criteria are you going after? We need some accountability. And going back to hockey, there when the refs are going to make inconsistent calls and the refs are going to find coaches fifty fucking grand for these outbursts and things like that. We need an explanation. We don't need to know exactly what was said in the code, but we need to know why this was, even if we don't agree with it, we need to know why so that the next time we can hold them accountable for what happened the previous time and the time again. Right. And and that's what annoys me about, again, the refs in the national hockey league and you know judges in, in mixed martial arts. We, we got to get, I've seen this take before. We got to get a pool reporter that yeah. can talk to the officials after games. And you see it in whether or not they, like whether or not they double down on some controversial call, the NFL has this and it at least provides some level of transparency. Like even just a little bit. We're not asking for, we're not asking for major changes. We're asking for just some accountability. Yeah. And some answers. Why? Yeah. And maybe the explanation actually, Oh, I never would have thought it from that perspective. Or maybe the official says, yeah, he said, Torch said such and such to me. And at that point, you're like, okay, that's that's over the line. That makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah. But we'll we'll never we'll never know we'll until never know. that sort of stuff happens. No. Oh man. Hashtag free torch, just like in 2014. Yeah. I'll, I'll pay his fine free. myself. <laughs> um, all right. Last but not least, Seth, I will uh, I'll actually share this on screen here. Let's just quickly go over some of the trades because you and I haven't talked since trade deadline. Um, we talked a little bit last weekend when we we're kind of finalizing, you know, this collaboration between SodaPod and Locked On now uh, moving forward. And again, can't wait to jump on segments of your show as well, whether we do live streams down the road or just podcast segments. I'm very excited and honored that you would uh, allow me to jump on that as well. But uh, let, let, let's just fire it up here. We have it on screen again, guys, on the audio side of things. If you want to join us to get the full experience of the SodaPod now on video, please join us there. So to be honest, the, the trade deadline started when Vancouver got Lindholm from yeah. Calgary, in my opinion. Um, at the end of January, Sean Monahan to the Winnipeg Jets. That was another early one where I was like, all right, the dominoes are starting to fall. When Dallas got Chris Tanev too, that was another one where I'm like, okay, there's, there's teams making kind of early big moves here for you. As I scroll here, what was, what was the official like big start? Was it Mantha where like, that was when like the trade deadline days. Cause we'll throw, we'll throw uh Thursday into the mix there. Is that when it, the ball really started rolling for you? I think so. That was, that was when we kind of got the, okay, the, the trade deadline is officially open for business. And you know, it's no surprise that the Vegas golden Knights made two of the biggest moves um, at, at the deadline by not only getting Mantha, but then, Hey, Tomas Hurdle is all of a sudden available oh, wow. and on the move. It's like, where did that come from? Um, it, it, I know, I know people dog the the Vegas Golden Knights a lot for circumventing the cap. The main, the big thing here is that that um, 
that stipulation exists and is available for every single team to use. Oh yeah, I hate when people complain about it because it's not it's not a unique rule. It's not like no one even knows about this. It's in everyone's faces, and a lot of teams take advantage of it. So, it's it's just the classic example of because the team that a particular fan is following didn't do it, that that's why people get frustrated. But no, I I thought the Vegas Golden Knights had a uh, fantastic trade deadline week. How about the Avs, though? How about the decision to send Bowen Byram to the Buffalo Sabres in exchange for Casey Middlestat? Like, Byram is a young prospect. Like, he's expected to be a real good defenseman. Does he have some, some things that he maybe needs to work on throughout the rest of his career? Absolutely. But the fact that the Avalanche took a spot in their lineup that was a glaring weakness because Ryan Johansson was not getting it done. The fact that they took and traded from a position of depth on their roster. You've got Kale McCarr. You've got Devon Taves. You've got some real good defensemen. They go out and they fill a clear need with middle stat to be their second center for the, the rest of the season. Like, these are the types of moves that the good teams make is mm. they find ways to help themselves out and deal from areas of strength as opposed to kind of just stockpiling everything that you've got. It's nice when you're not in contention to have a ton of draft picks, but Vegas never drafts anybody. Nope. The The Avalanche have not since their window open. They haven't really drafted as much either. Like, these teams use these Toronto draft picks. Toronto recently either. Yeah, they, they use these draft picks as assets to go get what they need. And so that's that's why the Wilds trade deadline was interesting to me because you go back to the Kalen Addison trade, the Brandon Duhame trade, the Connor Dewar trade, the Pat Maroon trade. All of those trades brought draft picks in for 2026. All yeah. of them. And how long ago did we trade Kalen Addison? Like it feels, it feels intentional. It feels strategic. It feels like trying to stockpile because now they've got a first, a second. They got two thirds, two fourths, two fifths, two sixths, and a seventh. They're not going to draft all those guys. No. Nope. Bill Guerin's up to something. It's going to be, it's going to be a fun summer, I think. I, I think I think we're going to see this team make some changes because I don't think you can, even if you have, even with the limitations you have, I just don't think if getting to the postseason is the true goal for this team on a yearly basis, I think considering what's happened this year, I don't think there's any way you can justify coming back with the same thing. For sure. And so I know you got the trade protections that are leading to these parts seeming immovable, but I think there will be a couple of moves made that'll be eye openers um, by this team this offseason. Yeah. And I like some of the smaller moves that teams made as well. I like the Panthers getting Vladimir Tarasenko at oh. literally half the cost, given that Ottawa's retaining 50% of his salary for the rest of the year. Um, whenever he's. Look, whenever he has the puck on his tape, he still has that shot. He may not be as fast as he was back in the day, but uh, no, I, I really like that to just solidify the depth there. Scoring depth there for Florida. Adam Henrique and Sam Carrick, good pickups for the Edmonton Oilers as well, especially Adam Henrique. Again, depth moves for them to go on a run. Yeah, dude, the Bowen Barm, I've watched this kid develop every single year in junior, playing for the Vancouver Giants before he was drafted um, out west in the WHL. Unbelievable defenseman. And I think that like he's... He he's not even close to a ceiling yet. So you just look at the back end of what the Buffalo Sabres have now. Oh Insane. my god. Dude. That might be that might be the best young decor yep. in the NHL. I 100 percent agree. I 100 percent agree. We talked about Vegas, or we didn't even mention they got Noah fucking Hannafin too from the Calgary Flames. Again, a, a top four defenseman as well. How about the um I, I thought the I thought the goalie trades were interesting. Because you had all this talk leading up to the trade deadline about the New Jersey Devils trying to make a big swing. Yeah, they were linked to uh, they were linked to Jacob Markstrom like all the way up until the the twenty third hour fifty ninth minute of the deadline, and then all of a sudden it didn't end up happening. 
So they go and get Capo Kakinen to uh, to help out in that goalie room by trading Vitek Vanacek, who was great last year. And they get Jake Allen too. So all of a sudden now, Jake Allen and Capo Kakinen is your goalie room for the New Jersey Devils. And it sounds like they're probably going to try to uh, to make Markstrom happen in the offseason again. But if you told me Jake Allen was going to be moved this year, I would have said you were crazy. <laughs> And yeah, a conditional. There was even someone in my live chat uh, on YouTube who was like, oh, I think Jake Allen's going to be moved. I think Jake Allen's going to be moved. I'm like, A, where are you getting this? And B, if if, so, if one of these insiders is saying it, just stop copying and pasting their their foolishness. And I'm I'm the dunce in this, uh, in this scenario because I'm like, I cannot believe he was actually moved. Yeah, no, that's a good point. The goalie movement was definitely interesting. Um, I, in the Wild, I didn't think they'd be active. However... Having said that, all the guys that they, all the moves that they made, I was like, those were the right moves to be made if you were going to yep. be active at the trade deadline as well. Before we just quickly highlight the la, uh, the new additions to the Minnesota Wild, any other trade that you want to just talk about here? I mean, the Jake Gensel one was huge. He didn't go to Vancouver, but uh, a, a massive, you know, a, a massive blockbuster trade in its own right. Matt Dumba moved to the Tampa Bay Lightning. Shout out to him. He gets to live in Florida and actually go on a run with that team and. I mean, the Tampa didn't have to pay anything for him. A no. fifth round pick, and they got a seventh as well to take to take him on this year. Wow. How about that to start trade deadline season? There were so many rumblings like teams like the asking price for Matt Dumba is a first round pick. It's like I don't think that I don't think that's accurate at all. And I don't think you would fetch anything close to that. And turns out they didn't. No. No. Um, yeah, it was just it was it was fun. I think it was fun to have um it was fun to have like the day before be as insane as it was and there still were a ton of deals. Like there were deals still coming in an hour after the trade deadline was done because that's just how that works with like you you call the league office and you say we've got a trade and they're they're processing them like for an hour after the deadline oh, yeah. has already passed. That's the fun part is when you hear them trickle trickle in at the end. And I'm always, it's, it's so weird for me it being in the afternoon now that I live in Minnesota because it's it's always before noon, you know, out west where, where you know where I grew up and where I started following hockey. So I was like waking up at like six a.m. every sing, every single trade deadline. I take off school or or work or whatever, and I'd literally just like post up from six a.m. to to noon. Or I'd like do a half day at work or just go to the afternoon classes because like, but then having said that, it's like it, it wasn't officially over until 3 p.m. my time because of all the, all the stuff trickling in. But uh, anyways, wild acquisitions here. They uh, they get Turner Elson, who uh, in exchange for uh, Nick Patan. Look, he's an, he's another veteran to be playing in Iowa. And Seth and I, when we were prepping the show here and and, and talking about him, we both found it with odd that not that they brought in a veteran to Iowa, but that they brought in someone who is replacing Nick Patan, who's kind of already a veteran. What are your thoughts on, on, on this trade? And do you think it's just maybe just a better quote unquote leader for the team, more of a captain type guy? Like w w why do you think this move was made? You know, it's interesting because you look at that Iowa team and they're they're not having a good season. They've had a ton of injuries they've had to deal with. They're a very young team, too. And this is just one of those kind of nondescript, like, let's just bring in a fresh voice to try to kind of help out these these youngsters. And, you know, Patan was having a great season. He put up he was putting up some points, but. I think the this screams to me more about the Rangers maybe seeing something that they were intrigued by than Bill Guerin saying, "Hey, this guy I think can really bring something to our yeah. mix." Like I feel For like sure. it was the Rangers that initiated this, as opposed to the Wild really seeking out. Yeah, because I was, was going to say, or just shopping Patan of all. Yeah. Well, guys, I, he, I he, feel he, like, he, he, like I watched Patan uh, develop and like, I thought he was going to be, I thought he was going to be something in the national hockey league. I really did. Yeah. And he's like such a textbook tweener, right? Like he's, he's played 170 games. Doesn't get any points to the national hockey league level. I think 54 games, 13 was his highest point total, but he's a point per game guy in the AHL, right? Yeah. It's this, this screams to me of the Rangers saw something that they yeah. were intrigued enough by to try to initiate this. I, I don't think 
I don't think Bill Guerin was going to spend his time and his energy shopping an AHL guy. It's right. just, this was just, this was much like the Declan Chisholm waiver claim. This was, was one of those awesome, kind of, oh Love yeah, him. I'm, I'm so excited for, for that the rest of the season and beyond because he just looks like a, as a young player that my, my big benchmark is just make an impact. And he, he clears that. And then some, every time he's out on the ice. He's on the show this week, by the way, Fellowship of the Rinks with Joe Smith and Hoppy. So there you go. Uh, dropping Excellent. Wednesday morning, right after the NCHC episode of MNCAA. Uh, Pat Maroon, they got back a conditional uh, six-round pick in 2026. And Luke Toporowski, uh, a left winger, 22 years of age. So a, a young prospect came out of the WHL. He played actually three seasons in the dub came back to the USHL for 32 games, then went back to the Spokane Chiefs that season and then played last year, or in 2022, sorry, 21 with the Kamloops Blazers. He's played two seasons with the Providence Bruins and actually started to put up a pretty good resume in the AHL. Uh, three points in two games already with Iowa. Do you, got any, uh, do you got anything to say about this guy? He's an Iowa guy too. Like he's he's oh, really? originally nice. from Iowa. So this is not this is an interesting, like That's cool. full circle coming back home uh type move. And I I don't know I don't know a ton about him, but from what I saw on Twitter and what I've seen in um some of the, the Lockdown Wilds live streams, uh there was mention that he comes from a pretty legitimate hockey family, like has I think his dad played hockey maybe brothers and sisters that played. And so there's, there's blood and there's uh, hockey blood in those veins. So I like, I that. like that. And you know, it's just, I, I always am going to be in favor of, especially considering who the wild were trading out at the deadline. You're trading Pat Maroon, Brandon Duhame, Connor Dewar. You're not going to get a huge return for those guys. Um, I like the fact that they just took a swing on a couple of prospects to see if they, can turn into anything of value Um, because even if it's somebody that doesn't factor into the, uh, the NHL equation at all, you need the AHL to be good. You still need to fill out those AHL rosters and you need, you never know. You need guys that are in positions to potentially be call-ups at the very least. And so I'm all about the the world, man. Right. Yeah. A hundred percent. Like you, you don't know you can line up everything to work perfectly from a depth perspective in your organization. And then you have years like this where every single player gets hurt and you may, you never know, you may need that third or fourth guy to be able to step up and, uh, and give you some minutes. And they may be a diamond in the rough. Who's like, wow, when given minutes at this level, we, we actually have something here that was off our radar scouting at, at that level. Last but not least, Seth, um, sad for a lot of us here, especially our friend Marissa. Connor Dewar traded to the... Oh, I, uh, sorry, <laughs> the dry hiving there. Not because of the whiskey. It's because of the Toronto Maple Leafs. God damn it. Why did Duane got to go to the abs and why did freaking Maroon have to go to Boston? Seth, seriously, from a Vancouver guy, why did Maroon have to go to Boston? Why... Why did Dewar have to go to the Maple Leafs? And then from a wild perspective, why the hell did Dewar have to go to Avs? Right. Anyways, that that aside, bitching aside there, the Wild actually, I think, out of all those trades, got the best return for, for Dewar. A, not, like, no conditions on the fourth round pick in 2026. And this Russian center, Dmitry Ovichinikov, who, again, 21 years of age, has played how many years pro in the K? Like three years of like substance in the KHL before coming over to North America. And he, he's he been playing decent with the Marlies this year. 20 games, 10 points, seven goals. Man, I'm excited to see what he brings too. Yeah, and, and again, this is like, this is just one of those swings on a guy that um, could end up giving you a little something. Like he... It's just, it's intriguing that you look at all of the time that he has already put in, in like the KHL and the the fact that he has played in those types of leagues. um, It's just 70 plus games too. Yeah. That kind of stuff. And that's something that the wild, I think target is pedigree is temperament. They target those types of guys. And so I'm, I'm intrigued to see what, uh, 
what of Shinnikov has in the tank himself. Um, and, but I think, you know, and I've I had, had a few listeners that commented this too. This is the one that has potential to kind of turn your head is is what I've been told. So I'm I'm intrigued. I'm excited to see what uh, what he can bring. And I mean, I know it's down in the MHL, but 24 goals in 55 games back in 2019, 2020 um, in 2020, 2021, he had 20 goals in 40 games. So the scoring ability is there. Yeah. He's it's just talented. a matter of like, can you, can you shape, can you mark, can you just get him to match like some of your other key prospects? Well, and the fact that he has oh, like seven goals, two assists in, in the AHL thus far this season, it's like, okay, like he's a goal scorer first. I like that. I like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it, it's, and I mean, it's, and it's pretty much the Russian invasion in Minnesota now in the, in the best possible way. Usually you don't say that here in the United States and it's a positive thing, but in this case in Minnesota, it's a very positive thing. And I cannot wait for year to come over as well. Knock on wood, fingers crossed, hopefully next season. Yeah. I, I, that's, that is an interesting one to me because it seems like we're starting to see the, uh, the minutes trimming that typically happens right before you sign your extension. And so, does the KHL maybe poke a little too much to where Yurov says, you know what? I'm good. I'm going to head play. to, I'm going to head play. to the uh, AHL and uh, start to get this going. And if he heads over here, like get him right up, get him right up. Honestly, like, yeah, there's going to be some growing pains a little bit. You know, there were, there were a little bit with Rossi too. There was a, there's a little bit with Boldy. I don't think there's going to be much with this kids. I think, you know, 20 games of up and down and then like we're, we're all systems go. So it's, it's next year is going to be an exciting year because that's going to be like the tease for when, okay, you got the money. Basically the shackles are free cap wise and you can play a little bit more with the team. Now, they do have players they have to re-sign guys. So I just was like, when, when, when the shackles are free, it's not like, okay, we have all this money to play around with. No, it's just, you can actually work with the roster you have yeah. and what you've been building. And that's important. So I'm, yeah, ne- I know we're still in this year. There's still potential playoffs on the horizon, but let's be perfectly honest, Seth, like the, the seeds have been planted for next year. And, and that's where the growth from this team is really going to come from. Well, and that's the, that is exciting for the rest of the season because you have to essentially win out this year to be able to put yourselves in a good spot because you have to a outpace the teams that are currently in the playoffs by nine points. So you have to play really, really well down the stretch. You also have to hope that they play below 500 to get you even into wild card two at this point. It's not impossible. And I think that's the kind of the funny line we walk between not wanting to see the team do well and just being realistic. Like yeah. I'm I'm gonna root if if this team gets to the postseason, I'm gonna root for them. Like I, even I'm gonna root. I root for them when they play every single time, but I'm not gonna glaze them for like for not being good. I, I will yeah. I will glaze, you know, bro. Uh, Brock Faber when he has a great game because of his stats here. And I feel like we, even when we talked about the Nashville Predators in the start of the show, going full circle here, we highlighted the good. We highlighted the bad. We highlighted the ugly. Like that's what we yep. do here. You, you mean locked on and soda pod and you know, the, the other podcast too, but like we, we, we remain in the realm of possibility. We, we call what we see and sometimes we're wrong. And sometimes I like being proven wrong because usually, especially when we're focusing on some of the negative stuff, that means that the team is improving. That means when we're proven wrong and it's usually a positive thing down when we go down that path. So I actually really respect uh, that you have built such a, a big fan base for your own show, Seth, but you can still converse with those fans who are, oh, you're being too negative. Oh, you're glazing too much you have a great job of finding that like middle ground and just be like, this is what I saw. I'm still a fan of the team. This is what I want. And I give them credit when it's due. Yeah. That's, that's all it is, is like, I know today is the, the game against the predators was a, it was a step that was needed. It's still long odds, but it just, that's one of those instances where it's just, it's so fun. And honestly, like, I can't speak enough to kind of 
bring this full circle. I just can't speak enough about John Hines willing to throw everything on the table for a game that he absolutely had to have. Like it's just, it's just something that we just do not see here in Minnesota, especially not just for the Minnesota wild, but that just, we've seen that with all of the teams, like whether it be 1998 and opting to take a knee as opposed to trying to push the ball with the number one offense in football for the Minnesota Vikings. And then Gary Anderson misses a kick, whether it be trying to uh, any number of examples like that aggressive have to do it all, have to put it all on the line to win is hard to not root for. And so 100%. John 100%. Hines has my full respect and my full attention after uh, being willing to do that to pick up an extra point that he needed. And so full salute, full salute for John Hines. Let's hope he applies that logic to John Merrill's minutes down the stretch. Seth, where can everybody find you if they're not already subscribed to your YouTube channel and or podcast? And what do you have coming up uh, this week? We, we got a fun week for you. Uh, we're going to obviously be uh, at the XL Energy Center for both Tuesday and Thursday's games. Uh, we've got our postcasts that uh, keep you covered after uh, every single Minnesota Wild game, whether it be a win or loss. We've got uh, we've got Alex McLeady coming on for McLeady Monday. Um, you and I will be chatting uh, later in the week to kind of, I, I think, on air production meeting. I'd love to uh, to do like a, a Wednesday for Thursday to uh, just see if maybe we do get Murat, who's Nadine off in the lineup yep. on Tuesday. And then we can uh, react to that for done Thursday's game. Done and done. You here to hear first, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, let's we workshop those ideas right right out in the open so the people know what to expect. But well, it's all because we've gone a little over here and we're not going to be hanging out too much after. <laughs> so it's like we might as well get the the planning stuff out of the way. <laughs> yeah, no, uh, not a problem there. We it's just it's a vibe. Locked on Wild is just yeah, a vibe show. Like I the love it. the live streams are vibes. The episodes. Anytime I hop on on another show, it's vibes. All about the vibes. Whether the team is winning whether it's two years ago where they're scoring just an insane amount of goals, whether it be this year where there have been some inconsistencies and you're you're fighting tooth and nail all the way through to the end of the season. We vibe it out. We have a good time. Yeah. What more can you ask for? No. I mean, I can't ask for anything more because I'm riding shotgun with you now, Seth. So let's freaking go. Um, well, that'll do it for this episode of the Soda Pod. Thanks again, Seth, for joining us this week. Cannot wait to jump on Locked on Wild. Yeah, later this week, Wednesday, Thursday. Talk about Marat. Talk about the week that is hockey. Talk about the week that is Minnesota Wild. Cannot get. Cannot wait for next week's show. Next, next Monday, Soda Pod to dive into fighting in the national hockey league and let's just hope that the that the wild like get like three more scraps in this week so we have a little bit more sustenance <laughs> for that but uh as always seth uh thank you so much can't wait uh to continue this collaboration the rest of the season and into the summer my man thank you so oh, much you guys got me for the off season too like oh i know we're just getting started. <laughs> Let's go, Seth. Thank you so much. And thank you to all the fans for when we dropped the news last week that we were going to be starting this collaboration. Soda Pod locked on. Me jumping on Seth's show. Seth jumping on my show. Seth, and I, I told you this in Twitter DMs, and this will be the last thing before we end this segment, but you guys, the fans, were ecstatic. The, the positive reviews and the excitement that we got from you guys, it, it, it warmed my heart. So, Seth, we... We're doing the right thing here, man. We're doing the right thing. This was the right decisions. You got to You got to give the people what they want. Exactly. I found mm -hmm. that out. I found that out through uh, many, many instances of simply giving a listener something that they're looking for, whether it be covering a topic or, you know, doing a doing an extra live show a week. Like you give the people what they want and they'll keep coming back. Absolutely. Well, Seth. I will see you next week. Thank you so much as always. A big shout out and thank you to my friend Seth Topa who who will be joining us weekly now on the podcast every single Monday. Let's fucking go. The Soda Pod is brought to you by our friends at Better Edge. Go check out Better Edge, ladies and gentlemen. Legal sports betting in the great state of Minnesota. And if you go to betteredge.com slash soda pod, and sign up there, you get 20 bucks. So go to betteredge.com slash SOTAPOD. 
create an account and claim your $20 today. It's a free platform with legal betting in this great state, among 44 other states as well. We launch Wild Game Day Pick'em Contest every single Minnesota Wild Game Day as well, ladies and gentlemen, where you can choose seven out of 10 picks those include money line, player point totals, etc. More competitions to come as well that we will host on the platform. So again, betteredge.com slash soda pod and claim your 20 bucks today. If you're really liking the platform and you want to get more out of it, you can look into and sign up for Better Edge Premium. Premium players have access to free entry to premium pick them contests where you can win up to $100, order grades, advanced order filtering, API access, and more. More details at betteredge.com slash premium. But before you even get to the premium side of things, go to betteredge.com slash sodapod, sign up, claim your $20 today, join our game day pickums, and I will see you on the platform. Well, that's it, ladies and gentlemen. That is the show. Excited to have Seth now in the rotation. Excited to be in the groove of things now, ladies and gentlemen. Cool hoppy hour vlogs every week, which is really sparked a fire under me on the creative side of things. So I look forward to either reviewing a beer, going out and about, filming a little vlog or a review to talk about the great craft brewery scene that is in this state and especially in the Twin Cities and just outside. And for me, that was always my niche when I started this show, hockey and beer. And it's cool to now have that segment evolve and for it to be a little bit more curated to you know isha's creative interests editing style and honestly it's just something that every week i look forward to do now which is awesome not only do i get to look forward to talk to seth every week i get to look forward to producing just a cool little piece of beer-based content that i get to add to this greater podcast and now video podcast as well on youtube so thank you to everyone who's continued to support the show and this brand as we continue to grow thank you to everybody again who's continued to support the soda pod as we grow as the brand develops i mean hockey all day every day of the week monday soda pod tuesday wednesday thursday mncaa and wednesday fellowship of the rinks with the athletic writer joe smith and then friday judd's buds don't forget to follow us on youtube don't forget to tune in every wednesday 6 30 p.m central for judd's buds live be part of the show be part of the live chat or just consume it via audio form every Friday. Thank you to those who've tuned in on Google, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, our entire run. And if you continue to listen to us on those platforms, please, the best thing you do for us this week, any week, is to give us five stars and a kind review. I mean, it doesn't even have to be a kind review. Just give us a review and five stars. It helps us get in front of more listeners on those respective podcast apps. And on YouTube, don't forget to like every single video comment on the videos that you watch as well as just like leaving us a rating and a review on the podcast side doing that on youtube just gets us in front of more eyes again can't thank you guys enough for helping us get to 1000 subs let's freaking go ladies and gentlemen let's keep growing with that being said i'm out of here ladies and gentlemen signing off i'm isha dromi alongside seth topol this has been the soda pod presented by our friends at better ed 7th avenue pizza northland vodka and waggle golf don't fear just drink some beer and stay wild.